Thank you everyone for joining this Arlington Land Trust program. Many of you know that the Arlington Land Trust, it's a 24 year old land trust. I'm one of the founding board members and uh, Arlington Land Trust owns the Elizabeth Island and uh, Arlington Land Trust and the Conservation Commission jointly steward the Sims Arlington 360 open space along the slope. Uh, Arlington Land Trust and the Friends of Great um, Arlington Great Meadows uh, jointly helped to protect and enhance public access at the 183-acre Arlington-owned Arlington Great Meadows in East Lexington. And um, I was excited to try to put this program together because I've been concerned about uh, light pollution for many years in my own professional work as a professional planner uh, and I work for a nearby town uh, as a head of the department in charge of land use, housing and development. Uh, I try to practice um, dark skies practices and, and try to instill that in my staff. Uh, and I've noticed Arlington brighter over the last few years. And I was delighted to um, discover Kelly Beatty when I observed a program that uh, I, I saw him present, and so I'm delighted to introduce Kelly. Kelly Beatty has been explaining the science and wonder of astronomy to the public since 1974, when he joined the staff of Sky and Telescope. He retired from full-time work in early 2018, but remains actively involved in many Sky and Telescope projects. An award-winning writer and communicator he holds a bachelor's degree from the California Institute of Technology and a master's degree in science journalism from Boston University. Kelly has been active in efforts to reduce light pollution for more than 30 years. He served for more than a decade on the board of directors of the International Dark Sky Association, now Dark Sky International, and is now an officer with its Massachusetts chapter. So Kelly has a wonderful presentation that will be about an hour, and we are going to um, uh, encourage questions at the end of the presentation. So thank you, Kelly, very much for being he here uh, with the Arlington Land Trust and our attendees. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing everything you have to tell us tonight. Oh, well, thank you very much, Carol. It's it's great to be with you. I'm actually uh, uh, a one-time resident of Arlington. I lived up in the Heights. Uh, in the Colonial Village apartment complex for 10 years or so when I first moved here from California. And uh, so I, I know the place well, it's near and dear to me. And, uh, and so I, I'm hoping that we can, um, that we can explore best practices and uh, uh, learn a little bit along the way. Just want to confirm that my, my presentation is showing okay. Yes, it is. All right, great. So this, uh, this is about uh, where we used to be, where we are now, and where we can go. And I want to set the stage with this quote about um, how we've fallen out of touch with the night. With lights and ever more lights, we drive the holiness and beauty of night back to the forest and the sea. Could have been written yesterday, but in fact was written um, a century ago by Henry uh, uh, Breston, who was a naturalist who spent a year out on the outer cape and it observed how beautiful it is out there without the invention. So that is uh as our as our sort of um entree into this topic, let me kind of define light pollution for you. Really it's it's basically the illumination of the night sky by artificial sources in a way that creates a disturbance in in the nighttime environment. There there are many facets to this. Uh, the glare from bright lights, the trespass of your neighbor's lights in your bedroom window, any disturbance of this nighttime lights, uh, nightscape. And the sad reality is that a lot of the light we generate with our outdoor fixtures at night never actually reaches the ground. It goes up into the sky and, uh, and creates a whole host of problems in doing so. So let's kind of set the stage for you. It's common here in Massachusetts, especially, to have towns with these beautiful antique or, or period fixtures like this one. This actually happens to be near, a, uh, in front of a Marriott courtyard, not far from where I live. 
And you can see there, uh, there's a there's a, a rather obvious bulb here in the middle and this kind of glass surrounding. Well, when this gets turned on at night, you're left with light going everywhere, including up. And uh, and this is the a sort of um, poster child, if you will, for 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 bad lighting. And when we talk about lighting in the nighttime environment, there's really kind of three sectors that are involved. One is easiest to understand. That's up light. That's anything that goes above horizontal that just goes up into the sky, illuminates the bellies of birds and airplanes and really doesn't do any good down on the ground. Then below horizontal, um, a lot of it ends up being useful light in what's called the task area or the target area. But there's a slice just below horizontal that you see there that's called the glare zone. And this has been getting a lot of attention recently. We'll deal with that in the course of this presentation. You might think that the most egregious lighting sources are the ones that send their light straight up into the sky, but that's actually not the case. If you think about our Earth and its atmosphere, uh, that light going straight up has a fairly short path through the atmosphere and then it heads out into space and it's done. Really the worst lighting from the standpoint of creating light pollution effects are beams of light that are emitted just above horizontal. Now, these are three computer simulations of the amount of scatter, uh, colored the reds and, and uh, bright colors, created by light uh, directed almost directly overhead in the top panel, uh, kind of medium in the center panel, and then just above horizontal, within 10 degrees of horizontal, but above horizontal in the bottom. And so consequently, uh, light pollution can be from sources that are very, very distant. I live in Chelmsford. I'm about 25, 30 miles from downtown Boston. And when I look straight up overhead from my location, I am seeing light pollution created by light from downtown Boston that is just skimming through the atmosphere just above horizontal. So that's what we're talking about. Here are some of the, the main culprits uh, some of these are not as are as bad as they used to be. Here are a couple of, of, of what were typical street lights 15 years ago. The one at the top had that very characteristic salad bowl light uh, of glass fixture on the bottom. And in this case, I think my, cur my cursor is showing up. The light bulb is actually below the main housing. And that glass uh, uh, shape there is used as a... a refractive element to kind of spread the light around. It actually creates light that actually goes above horizontal. A more modern fixture, although not used as much anymore, is this one where the light bulb is actually inside the housing and all of the light necessarily has to go uh, down below horizontal, assuming that the fixture is horizontally uh, or, or uh, position. Now, I want to call your attention to this little beanie cap here, about the size of a hockey puck or two hockey pucks stacked on top. That's the day-night sensor. Older style lighting uh, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s um, used uh, a kind of lighting source that really didn't like to be turned on and off very often. The, the most common type was what we call high-pressure sodium. This gives off a kind of peachy colored light, and you can still find lots of these lights around they don't like to be turned on and off at all. And so that little sensor on top simply turned the light on once dusk, uh, once the sun had gone down, left the light on all night long and uh, turned the light off just before dawn. And this dusk to dawn uh, 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 approach causes these lights to be on basically half of, uh, half of each day, 4,100 hours if you're keeping track out of every year. Another really bad kind of light is this. It's called a wall pack. It's what you would put on the side of a building. Um, I don't want to name names, but let's say CVS. And you want to illuminate the parking lot adjacent to your building. This is what you would use. It sends out a broad beam of light uh, that looks like this from the side, uh, which is very poorly constrained and sends light everywhere, including up. I should point out that this particular light has no business being there. It's on the side of the uh, the Environmental Protection Agency laboratory here in Chelmsford. If anybody should know better, the EPA should know better. 
One of the things that seems to be pretty common here in Massachusetts, I'm sure you have it in Arlington, is uh, pole-mounted floodlights like these. If you're a business and you want to have a lighting in your parking lot, but you're too cheap to install your own fixtures, you can ask uh, Eversource or National Grid to install these on the sides of the poles. They charge you a small amount for the um, prorated rental of the fixture, uh, plus the cost of the electricity, but it's a whole lot cheaper than installing them yourselves. And so consequently, these are very horrible fixtures from the standpoint of uh, light control. As you can see there, that one there on the left, so much of this light is going above horizontal that it's just a horrible, horrible thing. Now, one of the areas that's getting greater uh, interest and concern is sports lighting because uh, uh, more and more of our of our uh, activities are taking place after dark. This is at the U.S. Uh, uh, tennis facility in Long Island on Long Island. And I want you to, uh, for contrast, these are older style lights here on the right that are uh, very poorly shielded. And you'd never guess it, except that I'm telling you, is that here is an, the modern lighting which is in the adjacent field, you cannot tell that they're actually on. Uh, they are so well controlled. And that's the direction that high quality sports lighting is going. Uh, if this should come up in Arlington for a, a new ball field or something like that, you can control that light well. So why do we care so much about light pollution? What What's the point? Well, I'm gonna touch on five different reasons why it's a bad thing. The first is, as you might expect from a guy who's an astronomer, uh, it's the loss of the starry sky, what we call sky glow. <clears throat> I suspect most of you are old enough to remember uh, now almost, uh, now just over 20 years ago, there was a huge blackout in the Northeast. And uh, although Boston itself wasn't affected, every place of the Northeast of uh, Northwest of us was, Ottawa went dark, Toronto, Detroit, Buffalo, uh, all these cities were, were plunged, Cleveland were all plunged into darkness for, uh, for a long period of time. This is a photograph taken by somebody living in Toronto at the time. It was August, and so the summer Milky Way was beautifully arrayed in the sky, and with all the lights of the city off, he's literally taking this, he took this picture in the direction of downtown Toronto with all the lights off. That little glow down at the bottom, that's his home lit by candles and flashlights. Then a day later, the lights, the power came back on. He retook the same picture, uh, complete with the street light down there in the lower right corner. And you can see how much sky glow has robbed uh, him and all of us, actually, of our view of the nighttime sky. It's a, a horrible problem. Now, the National Park Service has become quite interested in preserving not just their daytime environment, but the nighttime environment as well. And about two decades ago, they created a kind of task force of amateur astronomers to go around to all the national parks to take uh, all sky imagery at night to see uh, how much uh, darkness there was, literally. This is uh, one of those from a very, very dark place out in Utah, National Bridge, Natural Bridges National Monument. Uh, so the, the, the picture down at the bottom, this is sort of a fisheye view of the whole sky. And then this is a panorama mode showing uh, all 360 degrees ar around the horizon. There are a couple of spots of, of little towns in the great distance that are causing a, a small glow, but this giant arch here, just for comparison, this is the Milky Way in, the, in that sky. And so it's a very, very dark environment. You can see down here, it's located in a very, uh, um, that's a, these are light, that lower left corner, that's a light pollution map showing it's black where there's no light pollution and uh, reds and yellows where there's a lot of it. Now compare that with this shot by the same team from uh, Mojave uh, National Preserve. And you can see that the, there's the, the color coding here is telling you that there's a lot more light in the sky, <clears throat> a lot more sky glow. And in particular, there's a hot spot here on the horizon, which is in the direction of Las Vegas, which is about 50 miles away. Now, these maps are created by taking actual photographs of the sky, and this is one of those photographs from that session. Uh, head, uh, as you can see in the direction of, of Las Vegas, this is what we call a light dome. 
uh, where on the horizon you see a huge glow of light that marks uh, some population center. But this streak that you see going vertically in the sky is not an artifact. It's a real thing. It's the searchlight from the top of the Luxor Hotel in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, I should actually remember what the candle power is, but it's it's like a million candle power, and it, it's leaving a streak in the sky as seen from 50 miles away. How sad is that? A little closer to home, the team went to Acadia and did some work there. Acadia is a pretty dark place uh, on uh, Cadillac Mountain. If you've ever been there at nighttime, it's, it's a beautiful place to do stargazing. There used to be a, a huge annual stargazing festival there. The glow on the horizon is from Bar Harbor, although I have to say the Bar Harbor has instituted an outdoor lighting ordinance. A lot of the people who come to Acadia do so because it's a, a pristine place. They enjoy the, the rugged outdoors of it, the, the night sky of it. And so uh, the town of Bar Harbor is doing a good job or has started doing a good job anyway of, of trying to control the lights in the town. There's a lot of controversy going on there right now because the business community wants their lighting to be on to attract uh, all those cruise ship passengers and the locals are not so thrilled about it. So farther west, uh, uh, the National Park took all these data, uh, National Park Service took all these data and made improvements in some of its key iconic facilities like Yosemite. All of the lighting in, in Yosemite was replaced with low uh, intensity, amber lighting, very low key. Same thing happened at Grand Canyon, a massive project there to, to try to return the nocturnal environment to something close to its natural state. Now, Dark Sky International, formerly IDA, has a certification pro program for dark sky places of various types. And these are some of the places around the U.S., that uh, have been certified. These are places that are, are dark now and intend to stay dark. Let me go back to that for a second. I want to point out that in our neck of the woods, there are a couple of places up in Maine that are um, uh, have been certified. One is Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. That is a, a, a what's called a sanctuary. There are so few lights there. It's essentially as black as it can possibly be. Nearby is Baxter uh, State Park, and uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club has had success getting certification for one of its facilities up there. So that's the starry sky part. Visual impairment is becoming a really important um, focus of research, especially for those of us who have gotten on in years. As we get older, our eyes become more sensitive to uh, uh, changing light conditions, bright glare, uh, causes us to become um, a little disoriented. Uh, you know, you've you've all experienced having a really car coming at you with really bright headlights, and it makes it difficult to see what road. And this becomes more difficult as you get older. It's important to note here that uh, this is your, this is going to be your physiology lesson for the night. Our eyes see light two different ways. During the daytime, we use what are called cones in our retina. This is what's uh, sensitive to color. It's the red, green, and blue that we uh, combine for various shades of color. <clears throat> and the cones have a peak sensitivity there in the green and yellow uh, part of the spectrum. But at night, our eyesight doesn't use cones. We use what are called rods. Rods are uh, super sensitive to, to light. And this scale here on the left, that's in powers of 10. It's a log scale. And so uh, the rods are like a thousand times more sensitive, but it's a black and white system. You can't see color with your rods at night. Furthermore, I want you to notice that the peak sensitivity has shifted to the blue green part of the spectrum. That will come back. I'll mention this now and it'll come back uh, again later on. So this notion of glare essentially means that whenever you have a bright source in your field of view, like a, a security light or something like that, your pupil shuts down and it causes you to be able to gather less light, which means that you can't see as well in the dark because of this bright light source. And just to show you how dramatic this can be, here's a security light in you know a generic backyard. I hope this isn't any of your backyards because it's really a bad way to light up uh, what, what you consider valuable. If you shield that, you can tell that there's somebody standing in the doorway of the fence there. And if you 
don't shield it, it's very, very difficult to see that that bad guy is uh, is there. And so um, the, the name of the game here is to reduce glare in our environment. We have lampshades on our lamps at home for a reason. We're not looking at bare bulbs because they're just too harsh to look at. And the same thing goes for the nighttime environment. Now, probably the greatest area of research right now is environmental consequences of light at night because so many creatures in our nighttime world do their thing at night. They, they, they move, they mate, they eat. Uh, and so um, that's become a really big deal. And I'm going to talk a little bit on lights effects on fireflies. And uh, just as a... Um, a note to you, Carol and others here with the, the Land Trust, um, if you're looking for a speaker, there is a, a, a young scientist named Avalon Owens at Tufts, who is one of the world's experts on fireflies and how uh, light pollution affects them. So some of the material that I've got here, I've borrowed from her. She would be an excellent speaker for you. This is a nighttime scene. All the things above the horizon are stars. All the things below the horizon are fireflies. And, you know, fireflies are are just one of those evening. We all enjoy looking at them. And they are, they are, they're doing what they do for a reason. You, you might not realize this, but um, lots of fireflies, there are different species, and those species flash with a particular pattern that is unique to their species. Usually the males are trying to att attract the females through their motion and uh, you know it's dashes and dots of various kinds. The problem is that if you're a firefly and you're trying to attract a mate, um, it, uh, it, you know it, it's fine if it's dark, but if you're if your nighttime environment is swamped with light pollution, you have a very difficult time, uh, uh, getting your point across, getting your message, uh, uh, advertising your availability, if you will. And it turns out, by the way, that this research has shown that in the presence of light pollution, the males still go out and flash their little tails off, so to speak, uh, but the females stay at, ho stay at home. They, they are turned off by the light pollution, and so a lot less mating takes place in light-polluted environments. There was a piece of uh, research done down in Brazil, this is an aerial photo of a college campus. And uh, right there in the center is their is their athletic stadium, which they decided to light up with new lighting, uh, a new set of lights that were basically on every night. And so the researchers did studies of how much this affected the this one sports stadium, how much affected it affected the firefly population. And so this is the number of flashing fireflies on the vertical axis as a function of whether the lights were on or off. And you can see when the lights are on that they go way, way down. The fireflies just don't show up. And so that is a sad commentary on what is a beautiful part of summer. I don't have fireflies in Central California where I grew up. I'm thrilled to have them here in my backyard. I just enjoy watching them. And it's sad that so many of them are being... Um, turned off, so to speak, by the presence of light pollution. But more broadly, nocturnal pollinators uh, are, are tremendously affected by light pollution. And uh, they, they come out in much fewer numbers in light polluted environments. And you say, well, what are nocturnal pollinators? For those who don't know, we see butterflies by day, but at night, it's the moths that are doing pollinating in the dark uh, when we're asleep. And so the, the lack of pollinators at night uh, is a significant problem. And even more broadly than that, uh, there is something going on which is known as the insect apocalypse. I did not make that up. You can look it up yourself. Essentially, worldwide, the number of, of uh, insects has declined 50 years. And when scientists look for reasons for that, uh, one of the, obviously there's loss of habitat, there's pesticides, there are all kinds of reasons, but light pollution is a significant cause. And uh, it's, it's, it's now been determined that roughly a third of the insects that are attracted to a lighting source uh, at the beginning of the night will die before morning, either through exhaustion or predation. And, uh, and that's, that's really an, an unfortunate thing. We need those, those bugs 
uh, for, for so many things. Uh, bird migration is another thing that's been strongly affected. You might not realize this, but 80% of birds uh, migrate, of, of those that do migrate, do so at night, and uh, they use the stars to navigate. And so uh, here on the East Coast, we have something called the Atlantic Flyway. It's right here. It follows the coast all the way down uh, to Florida. It's a major migratory route. You know, birds migrate by a combination of visual cues and magnetic cues in their in their uh, little brains. Um, and so when they cannot, when they're when they're on their own, when they're in the dark, they can follow, you know, a star or moonlight or something and know how to travel in a straight line. But if you put a city in the way, uh, then the birds are distracted and attracted to those city lights, especially skyscrapers. And so what they end up doing is thinking that the light source from a skyscraper is their guiding light. They'll just circle around it all night and they can fall from the sky uh, in huge numbers. Uh, I think statistically, the numbers of, of fatalities uh, just in in the United, in North America is more than 600 million bird deaths annually. Uh, and, and so this is, this is our city lights at work uh, causing these fatalities. Something not a big deal around here, but definitely down in the Gulf Coast is turtle hatchlings and the um, ability of those hatchlings, the eggs are laid in the sand, for the hatchlings to make it to the water, which they have to do quickly. In the absence of light, they know where to go. They see glints off the water. They know what direction to head. In the absence, uh, but in the presence of, of an artificial source of light, like an apartment complex or resort or something like that, they get distracted. They're drawn in the wrong direction, often ending up as roadkill uh, because they've they've gone in, you know, they've gone across roadways and such. So, as if that wasn't bad enough, let's talk about the human consequences of light pollution. Uh, you might you might not realize this, but your body makes a compound called melatonin, which is a remarkable substance that seems to be um, involved in all kinds of of uh, body wholesomeness functions, immune functions, and so forth. And we make that melatonin primarily at night. We don't make it during the daytime. Once it gets dark, at this point, uh, researchers discovered there's a little sensor in our eye that has nothing to do with vision. It's hardwired to the pineal gland in our brain, which generates the melatonin. And literally this sensor is like an on-off switch that tells the brain to either make or not make melatonin. And so at night when it's dark, you don't even have to be asleep. All you have to be is in the dark with your eyes closed. Melatonin is being produced in your bloodstream. And if you if you disrupt that during your normal sleep cycle, if you have a habit of getting up and going to the bathroom and flip, flipping on the lights or raiding the fridge for a midnight snack, your melatonin production crashes and has to start all over again. And why is this bad? It's been known for, for more than a third of a century now for about a third of a century, that the exposure of our bodies to light at night where we ordinarily would be sleeping is disruptive to that melatonin cycle and actually leads to increased risk of breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. And this is most uh, affecting people who do shift work like uh, emergency room nurses or, or uh, uh, graveyard workers at factories. And here's what's going on. Uh, this is this is with mice, not humans. So don't don't freak out. Um, this is a, a a lab experiment where mice were were implanted with human uh, um, cancer, breast cancer, and then either exposed to complete darkness, which are the open circles there on the right, or constant light. And the growth of the tumor was much more rapid in constant light because there was no melatonin being produced in these mice. Whereas the ones who were kept in the dark and had constant melatonin in their bloodstreams, the tumor growth was much, much slower. Now, we don't know. We, we haven't done these experiments on humans yet. But there is this cause. Uh, uh, it's more than just coincidence that people who live in urban environments with a lot of light around have higher incidences of cancers. And so um, it's been it's been declared uh, almost 20 years now that uh, shift work involving circadian disruption is probably carcinogenic. In fact, this this uh, this background photo is a fortunately it's been corrected. This was a housing, a senior housing complex in Chelmsford. 
The American Medical Association has weighed in on this, not once, but twice. Uh, about a decade ago, they they uh, established a policy that you know, talked about the pervasive nighttime lighting can create per, uh, potentially harmful health effects. And so we, we humans can be affected too. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have had uh, nights where you've, you've just not gotten enough sleep or you did a red eye flight or something like that. And you wake up groggy and tired because you didn't get good sleep. You didn't get the melatonin production. Last thing I want to touch on is energy waste. We've all seen photos like this. This is a photo of, of Earth at night taken by satellite. This is actually a quite old photo at this point, uh, taken more than two decades ago. It's actually composite of a bunch of photos pieced together. This is uh, what a little bit more recent. This is what the United States looks like at night. And when I first saw this, you know, you can make out all of the East Coast cities and you can see how the Rockies are really nice and dark for the most part. You can see the web of, of, of uh, roadways connecting all the cities in the East. And then I noticed this blob up in North Dakota and another blob where I know there's no big cities in Texas. I mean, this is Dallas, Fort Worth over here. Or I know all about that. And I thought, where the heck are these coming from? And the answer is, I'll give you a few seconds to think of it yourself. These are oil fields, fracking fields in the Dakotas, oil fields in Texas that are lit up like uh, Christmas all the time, every night, so that the, the uh, operations can go on 24-7. Really kind of an unfortunate thing. This is a... Um, uh, taken by the crew of the International Space Station on a trip up the East Coast uh, to give you a sense of it. Uh, this is New Orleans over here. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is New Orleans here. This is Houston here, sorry. Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. As we head up the East Coast, here's Atlanta. Pretty obvious. Florida is a wasteland of light. Every Everyone who's been to Florida knows that. Uh, here are all the East Coast cities, the Carolina coast here. Then we come up to... Um, uh, Richmond and Washington and Baltimore, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City here. Here's all Long Island completely lit. Here we are in New England and uh, uh, the Boston area. Notice that up here in Maine, it's quite dark, northern Maine. This per, uh, glowing band here, that that is partly aurora, but it's partly something called air glow. Uh, that is a, uh, a phenomenon in, in really dark skies. You can pick that out. So uh, this problem with light pollution has been getting uh, worse. I don't need to tell you that, but uh, about this time last year in Science Magazine, a team of scientists led by Chris Kaiba, who's a German researcher, one of the world's great specialists in, in light pollution, took a database of citizen science observations that I'll get to in a moment uh, and determined that the rate of increase of light pollution is seven to 10% per year, per year. That level of increase is just unsustainable. And, and in fact, represents a kind of existential threat, if you will, to the night, to the night as we know it. Now, I wanna go back to those space station, uh, those uh, views from space. Here is the East Coast. You can recognize that Boston's up here, upper right corner. This is a, a better view of Boston taken about, at this point, about two decades ago, uh, maybe 2008, 2009, by the crew of the International Space Station. And you can see downtown Boston. Uh, you can see the, the, here's the Deer Island uh, treatment plant right here. You can see it glowing. And you see this web of, of, of roads running away. And you might say, oh, those are all the interstates. There's there's the Mass Pike heading out to Worcester and I-95 heading down to, to Providence. No, that's not what that is. Those are all the state routes where there is commerce all along them. All of the, you know, the McDonald's and the and the gas stations that are open all night, every night now. We're in a 24-7 society. Those are what are causing the illumination along those along those roadways. Now, when I first saw this, I was actually living. I had moved to uh, to Chelmsford from Arlington, but I knew Arlington to be a pretty dark place, generally speaking. And then I, when I zoomed in on it, I noticed this one spot. Right. Well, here's Arlington Center up here. Okay, that's that I understand. And here's this is 128 here. 
Um, and here's the the you know the rest stop that's uh, near 2A. But I said, what the heck is that bright spot along Route 2 near the Arlington Lexington line? It turns out that's the Mass Department of Transportation Highway uh, office. It's lit up all the time. The lights are really bright. Next time you go by it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And you can see it from space, folks. That's how bright it is. Well, let's talk about Arlington a little bit. This is a map of light pollution as measured from space in your neck of the woods uh, from last November. And I picked November because I, I, I knew it hadn't snowed yet. So this is, this is actual ground cover. Uh, the color scheme here is uh, black is best, blue is good, green is okay, yellow is bad, and red is awful. And uh, Arlington, by and large, is in, is in pretty bad straits. Curiously, Arlington Heights is a little bit darker than Arlington Center for reasons that I'm not sure why. I'll have to go back and check. But there is something that you can do with these data, which are being they've been taken by satellite over a period of a couple of decades now. So I can draw a box around Arlington, more or less. I'm sorry if it's not quite right, but it's pretty close. And I can measure the amount of light pollution going into space. And this is the trend over time for your town. And I'm happy to report, well, there's good news and bad news. The good news, I'm happy to report that over the last 15 years or so, the amount of light pollution in Arlington has actually decreased 3% a year. Now, that's an average. And I want you to pay close attention to these spikes here. You see these spikes? These are all taking place at the beginning of the year. This is when there's snow cover on the ground. So Kelly, don't pay it. Repeat what, what percent, because I think the audio cut out for a second. What percent? Oh, about 3% per year decrease uh, as as noted by the red line. I'm sorry if the audio is cutting out. Is that a, is that a, a lot or just occasional? Uh, infrequently, but on occasion. So that's why I'm not interrupting you because I think it's it's and it may only be on my um, computer. But thank you for repeating that three. Okay, what but you really should be paying attention to are all the lot dots down here, which is the the better trend, and that's the good news. The bad news is that the current generation of satellite sensors are relatively blind to blue wavelengths of light. And why that's important is that all of the LEDs that have been installed everywhere for the last 10 or 15 years are quite rich in blue light. And so consequently, the they're sort of getting underreported in terms of their brightness. Um, and so we'll get to that a little bit more but if you want to follow up on this please make note of this uh url i i know this is being recorded so you can go back and find this lighttrends.lightpollutionmap.info you can play this game with any part of arlington or the entire boston area uh and and create charts just like this uh or or just you know explore the database the data are uploaded every month so you can do it on a month to month basis that's why you can tell, for example, that winter, there's more light going up into space because it's reflecting off of snow. Now, I know that there is light pollution in Arlington. and It's no, it's uh, hardly news to you, nor to me. This is uh, along Mass Ave in the center of town, um, in front of Cafe Nero. You have what are called post-top fixtures. Uh, this is common in towns that feel they want to pretty up their downtown areas uh, and improve the lighting and draw people into the downtown, which I know Arlington is, is great at that, great restaurants and so forth. But the lighting fixtures themselves were probably chosen by somebody from a catalog who thought they would look terrific at daytime, paying no attention or little attention to how they would look at nighttime, which is what you see on the right. This particular style of fixture is notoriously bad, not only in terms of uplight, what goes into the sky, but especially in terms of glare. So as you go down Mass Ave in Arlington, you see these lights from far away because they are throwing a lot of light out to the side, creating a lot of glare. Uh, good when it comes to lighting up the nighttime environment. Um. 
my computer is saying that my computer connection is un unstable. So I hope this continues okay. Uh, this is a couple of examples. Uh, Carol uh, provided these to me. Uh, these these are wall packs uh, somewhere in Arlington um, along a small business. It looks like it could be in the uh, in the district near the theater. Um, these are horrible sources of light. They do they they do more far more damage than they do good. And one of the kinds of lighting that has become pretty prevalent in recent years is uh, uh, decorative lighting, festoon lighting, the kinds of stuff that you would see at Christmas, except it's on every night now in a lot of places in Arlington and elsewhere. Uh, I'm actually working on a new outdoor lighting bylaw for Chelmsford. We all have one on the books, as you have had for quite some time, uh, and it will specifically address festoon lighting, how bright it can be and when it can be on. I know that Arlington has an outdoor lighting ordinance. You've had one since, I think, 2005. It's been updated a couple of times. I saw Paul Schlickman here in the uh, in the audience. I know that Paul was in, involved in the 2019 um, um, uh, update. But stuff like this, the festoon lighting is not uh, covered at all. And in fact, generally, the kinds of, of language that's in your outdoor lighting ordinance is very difficult to enforce because it's it's vague and not too specific. And you're you're not alone in this in this uh, in this sense. There are more than 50 towns in Massachusetts that have outdoor lighting ordinances. And very few of them go into the kind of specificity that we really, really have a chance of controlling the light. So I ask you as members of the Arlington Land Trust to take the first steps in improving your own environment. You as individuals can do a lot, actually, uh, aside from storming uh, town hall and demanding change. You can do a lot just in your own individual environments. Uh, first and foremost is turn your lights off when they're not needed. That's almost goes without saying, but I have to say it. Make sure that your, whatever lights you have outside are shielded so that they not only keep the light from going up, but keep them from creating glare. And if you can use dimmable bulbs uh, that can be you know, addressed, like for example, just as one example, it turns out that if you think about it, the times that we are most likely to have our porch lights on are after sunset until maybe nine or 10 o'clock. And then we turn maybe turn them off. And yet those particular hours are the most active times for fireflies. So you've turned on your porch light at exactly the wrong time. And one way you can help with that is to use a dimmable bulb so that it's not very bright. You can use lights with a warm, what we call a warm color temperature that don't emit very much blue light. I'll touch on this in a second. And of course, you can use uh, lights that aren't very bright to begin with. All of these things will help. Every little bit helps. Uh, you know, we we tend to be um, most up in arms about a neighborhood light that is really kind of in our face, that's uh, on our property. And why not? It's your it's your personal space that's being invaded. And I have to tell you, though, honestly. Uh, residential lighting is 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 not the low hanging fruit here. It's really the the commercial lighting, the street lighting, and so forth that creates the most light pollution. But in any case, the last thing you can do, of course, is especially if you've got security lighting in your backyard, is to put it on timers or a motion detector. Uh, there is no value, really, no value in having a security light on all night, every night. Because all it does is is um, it, you as the homeowner, unless you're looking at your bedroom window all night, people can come and go in your yard because you're lighting it up for them. Whereas if you have a motion sensor, a motion detector light, uh, when that light comes on, it says to the person trying to enter your yard, I see you. Uh, what are you doing here? Um, and another thing that you all can do collectively and individually is to just point your lights down. Don't point them out from the side of their of your building, as as in this example. Point them down, just like having a lampshade on these lights. This is a situation uh, involving a private school on the island of Nantucket. They installed some just horrible LEDs. Uh, some of the activists down there got involved and got them to simply take the existing lighting and point them down, and this was the result. You can see the dramatic improvement. 
uh, all of the all of the you know the entryways are are much better illuminated. I mean, this is this is now good lighting, and you can have that as well. All right, I'm going to spend a little bit of time before we close on LEDs, uh, like that Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. LEDs are a once in a multi generational change in the way we light our night. Most of the lighting that is being replaced by LEDs has been in place since the 1950s and 60s, or at least that is the technology. And LEDs are marvelous in so many ways. They're incredibly efficient in terms of electrical use. They can do all kinds of tricks. They can be turned on and off at will. They can be dimmed uh, and they last a long time. There's lots of good uh, coming out of LEDs. But one of the bad things about them is that they intrinsically give off a lot of blue light that their predecessors did not. I'm gonna introduce you to the concept of color temperature or technically correlated color temperature. This has to do actually with, um, with stars and the color of stars. Who knew that stars have color, but they do. It's counterintuitive because we think of red as hot and blue as cold, but when it comes to light, it's the other way around. The hotter a source in terms of its temperature, like on the surface of a star, then the more blue light it gives off. And this, this applies to, to, um, to lighting sources as well. The lower the temperature, the redder the light. And you know this sort of intuitively. Imagine a candle flame and the blue flame from a, uh, a gas grill or your stove top. The blue flame is much, much hotter than the yellow flame of the candle. And so uh, lighting designers have used this color temperature measured in, in Kelvins, that's what the K stands for, as a proxy for how much blue light is contained in a fixture. The higher the temperature, the more the blue light, as this sort of uh, example shows. And this is, <laughs> I throw this in just for comic relief, this is an LED gone bad. Uh, it has malfunctioned in a way that it is only emitting purple light. And this this does happen from time to time. Uh, this was not intentional, but boy, does it give an eerie glow to the neighborhood. In any case, color temperature is now part of the lingo of how we buy lighting. Next time you buy a light or just go, go to your pantry and take a look at the packaging for a light that you haven't installed yet, it'll tell you how many lumens it puts out. It'll tell you how many watts it uses. It, and that, but it will also tell you the color temperature. It might not have a pretty colored bar like this one does, like, like this table, label does, but it will tell you the color temperature. The 3000 is a warm white. It's listed on all bulbs. Now, why is this all important? I want to go back to this diagram that you saw earlier and how our night vision is most sensitive at blue wavelengths of light. This is really bad. Because the more blue light we pump out at night, the more sensitive our eyes, our night vision is to that. This is an old style light. What I, I mentioned this earlier, a high pressure sodium light. And you can see this is its spectrum. You can see there's a lot of yellows, a lot of orange. That's why these lights have their peachy color. You notice down there on the lower left, very little blue light is being emitted. Now compare that with the amount of blue light being emitted by an two kinds of LEDs, one with a 3000 Kelvin uh, color temperature and the other with 5000. On the 5000, look at that giant blue spike. A lot, just next time you, you have, if you have a cheap LED flashlight, take a look at the light coming out of it. It's a very bluish light. And that's because that's where LEDs are most efficient is when uh, the, their light is, uh, is um, unfiltered as this one on the, on the right is. But Here's that, the, that same 5,000K curve. That's the heavy black curve there. Now, I want you to notice the dashed line. The dashed line is the sensitivity of that little sensor in your head, in your eye, that's telling the brain to make melatonin or not. It is right in the wheelhouse of that sensitivity. And so when we have blue light in our nighttime environment, it does a number, not just on our human circadian rhythm, but on the ecosystems of all those nocturnal animals. It even increases the sky glow through what's called Rayleigh scattering. A wavelength of blue light, like in that peak, is six causes 16 times more scatter in the atmosphere than a wavelength of red light. 
And so that's why we have more sky glow now uh, because of, uh, if nothing else, the introduction of all these LEDs. Now you might hear some people, and maybe that some of the, the people in your town government. I'm I am guessing. I haven't looked closely. Um, uh, Carol is going to help me uh, uh, suss this out. I am guessing that the lighting that you have in in Arlington along your streets is four thousand Kelvin, which isn't the worst it could be, but it's far from the best. And often people who are uh, supporting those four thousand Kelvin. Uh, bulbs say, you know, it's just like moonlight. If you like moonlight, you'll like these. Well, no, it's not like moonlight at all. Uh, it, it that blue spike is makes it very much unlike moonlight. The better would be to get something far, far down in the temperature. Twenty two hundred Kelvin is a is the new uh, sort of floor for for outdoor lighting now. And let me show you a couple of examples of that in just a second. Cambridge about a decade ago, installed 4,000 Kelvin uh, LED streetlights throughout the town. It was the best available at the time, to be fair to the designers. I know the guy who was the lighting designer for this project. And still, I would hate to be the person in this house with this much light shining in my bedroom window. But to their credit, Cambridge uh, installed what are called um, uh, active electronics, uh, active controls on their streetlights. Every one of the streetlights in Cambridge can be addressable by computer, by a computer network. And so consequently, at 10 o'clock at night, all of the streetlights in Cambridge go down to half power, so to make it less obtrusive. And I don't know whether the streetlights in, in Arlington have uh, active controls or not. I suspect not. But it might well be that they are capable of having them. Um, the um, the 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 sensor on that little beanie sensor on top can be replaced with electronics that can connect all of those streetlights to a central control facility. It would be something if you're looking to improve what you've got without a wholesale replacement. I would look into getting active controls on the streetlights that you have, uh, and I and and that could make a huge difference not only in the amount of light pollution that you're creating, but also in the the consumption of electricity. Well, the AMA has again weighed in on LEDs and, and also this color temperature issue and recommends uh, has recommended since about 2016 use of 3000K or lower. I want to show you where the future is with streetlights. I mentioned these high pressure sodium lights and the fact that they give off a peachy orange color. One of these is a high pressure. This is in the town of Pepperell, which about two years ago replaced all of its streetlights, its, its existing streetlights, with LEDs, but the LEDs that they used were 2200 Kelvin color temperature, very similar to the high pressure sodium. One of these lights is the old one. One of them is the new LEDs. Can you tell the difference? The answer is the one on the left is the LED. It creates less glare. It was the one favored by citizens in town by a wide margin, gives better uh, control, far less glare, and, and of course, far less cost. They're saving um uh you know a hundred thousand dollars a year on outdoor lighting now if i were to give this talk 15 years ago i'd have been well you know astronomers were a sort of a special interest group right and uh and a lot of the pushback that i got back then was because i as an astronomer wanted to have my skies dark so i could watch the skies it's not about that at all you haven't heard me talk about astronomy hardly at all in this presentation it's about human circadian function. It's about energy waste. It's about preserving our nocturnal environment, which I know that as members of the land trust, you're all involved with that. And I want to tell you that, you know, the general public now has a much better awareness of light pollution. There have been stories all the time. Um, most recently, there was a story just a couple of days ago in the New York Times about someone who went out to one of these dark sky certified sites out in the Rockies and just reveled in what they saw. Uh, probably the most iconic uh, story is this one uh, with the National Geographic cover from, from about 15 years ago. That is downtown Chicago, seen from the air. And uh, it was uh, light pollution was the cover story. I would I would draw your attention. I mean, I've been at this for an hour almost, and, and there's a lot of information here for sure. 
But if you would go to the Dark Sky website, darksky.org, and look up or or go on uh, YouTube and look up a, a little short film called Losing the Night. It's about 10 minutes long. It's a public service uh, uh, video that was created by the IDA to be shown at, you know, council meetings and neighborhood association meetings and at Arlington Land Trust meetings so that you can all be kind of brought up to speed in a fairly short period of time with what's going on. Really crucially, throughout this 30-year saga of mine, you know, for most of that time, almost all of that time, the lighting industry itself was opposed to what I've been talking about. They had a vested interest in keeping things status quo. And then about four years ago, they finally, so to speak, saw the light. The Illuminating Engineering Society, IES, which is the standard setting organization for all of the United States when it comes to lighting, indoor and outdoor, partnered with IDA to create these five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And they're really kind of common sense if you look at them. They're listed there. You know, that light should have a purpose used only when it's necessary, no brighter than necessary, and use warmer color when possible. And this is a sort of graphic that shows how you can go from a horribly bad light on the left through a series of stages through shielding and changing the color temperature and so forth into something that is what we would really call dark sky friendly. Now, I want to get back to this report that I mentioned earlier, how uh, citizen scientists uh, recorded on the ground, measuring the night sky above them, how much light pollution was increasing. This project, this citizen scientist project is called Globe at Night. And I want you to all remember this because I have homework for you. I want you to go to the Globe at Night website. It is a way for you, everyday people without any equipment at all, to gauge how dark your sky is and to report that to a, a global database. And the, the, the premise is very simple. Astronomers use something called magnitude to determine how faint the faintest stars are that are visible to the eye. The darker your sky, the fainter the stars, the higher the magnitude number. And so uh, if you go to the Globe at Night website, you'll uh, you can do this. Or it doesn't you can just go to it on your on the on your phone. You can print out these charts. You you make a determination using comparison charts like this. Look up into the sky. They're specific for the time of year. Different charts for different times of the year. How many stars you can actually see? You make an estimate of the magnitude. You go online to the portal. You record the time, date, your conditions. Was it cloudy? Was it clear? Uh, where you were and how faint the stars were, you can see, and it goes into a it goes into this database. Now you can get fancier, uh, and maybe depending on how active you as a group want to become, you can buy one of these sky quality meters that you see there on the right. They cost about one hundred and twenty dollars. They're not expensive, and they give you a digital readout. It is literally a dig a number that tells you how dark your sky is. It takes about five seconds to do this. I have one of these. I carry it with me wherever I go. Anytime I'm, I am recording these and reporting these. And so what happens is you make one of these measurements, whether with one of these meters or just by eye. You don't need the meter. You record it and, you, and it becomes part of this database. And I called up the data from last year for Globe at Night for your neck of the woods. And there is one spot there near the West Medford border. Uh, one person in Arlington made a measurement throughout all of 2023. That's pretty sad. Considering how powerful this database is, I task, I challenge all of you to make a globe at night measurement before the end of this year, report it. And when I come back a year from now for an update on this talk, I want this, this map full of little dots made by you that show how dark it is over your sky. There are a couple of things you want to bear in mind. You don't want to do it with your, like your porch light on, right? You need a dark space. You could go to one of your, your land trust uh, properties. In fact, this is a great way to keep tabs on how much the light pollution is increasing where you are, where you're, the places that you value in town. Uh, and over the course of the year, um, the years, months and years, you can see whether your light pollution is getting better or worse. But at the end of the day, folks, light, controlling light pollution is a, 
Very simple thing. And it's a win-win. If we can control light pollution, that means we're, we're controlling the light in our nighttime environment. We're improving the nighttime environment. We're using less energy. We're saving money. It's Think about it. What kind of pollution can you control and save money in the process? So I leave you with this. When it comes down to lighting, like when you need it, where you need it, and just the amount necessary because actually everything else is waste. And I thank you very much for your attention tonight. Uh, there are some ways to get a hold of me. I'm not shy. I'm happy to chat with you individually or collectively. Um, and uh, there's my phone number and, and how to reach me. And that will be part of the recording, so you can go back to that. Uh, Carol, I think we'll I'll just close for now and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. Standing ovation. <laughs> I'm clapping. Uh, that, that was fantastic. Um, I, I want anyone who has a question or comment, please do not hesitate to raise your hand or just uh, start speaking. If it gets too crazy, I'll, I'll do a little more crowd control, but um, I don't see a hand yet. Please um, don't hesitate. While uh, you're contemplating your question, I want to ask Kelly if there is um, to comment very briefly on the comparative ease or low cost of retrofitting things like wall packs or uh, trying to see if we, what we could do about uh, fixing those so-called pedestrian lights um, in Broadway, in Arlington Center, and in East Arlington, those post cap lights, I think you said they're called. Yeah, post top lights, right, acorn shape. Um, so any... Uh, you know, there are, there are scads of different LED manufacturers, both for everyday lights and for street lights in particular. And the street lights come in a range of styles and powers and color temperatures, but they also come with a bunch of options. And so for a residential street light, the kind that you have that's just got a flat panel that shines down, if you've got a problem with that light shining onto your yard or into your in the uh, your your house, it's entirely possible that that particular model comes with what's called a house side shield. It's a shield that's literally like a little skirt that's put underneath the, 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 uh, the LED to block it from shining in the direction of your, of your home. So that's for the, the lights that are residential that don't look like those post top lights. They're just on poles like, like you're used to seeing. Um, for those ones in the downtown area, I was talking to Carol about this. If you can determine what the manufacturer and the model is almost certainly now will exist a baffle and in, think of a venetian blind uh it would be a a, a conical uh, baffle that will fit around the the light source and help direct the light down away from the glare zone and onto the ground uh whether those exist for yours lights or not i don't know but i am i'm happy to tell you that they exist uh, often uh with many models the cost of installing them will be uh, buying them and installing them will be small. It will depend on whether and Carol and I we're, we're talking about this whether Arlington owns its lights outright beyond the ones in the downtown area, which I think you do, or whether they're still owned by the utility. That will help uh, to dictate how easily that process can be done. Great, thank you. And I see that William Icamp has a question. Uh, please, uh, let's see, uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. I think you have to unmute yourself, Mr. Eikamp. Seems unmute. Well, perhaps we can go on if, to another question. I can't un unmute him from here. He's got to do it himself. So. Okay. William, so, if you can hear us, try hitting your space bar and holding it down. That's okay. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> Maybe he's out making a dark sky measurement right now as we speak. Oh, he was really motivated by by your challenge, which I, I'm going to try to take you up on that challenge. 
you know, I have to say this globe at night, it's, it was designed for, uh, uh, grammar school children, fifth graders. So, I mean, if you think you're up to you know, the capability of a fifth grader, um, what's so cool about it is that you go out you make this measurement, you record it on the website and then you run over to the map and you can see your dot. It's, it's instantaneous and it's very gratifying to see, you know, that you have contributed, uh, in, in a small way, but, uh, you know, no less significant way to, uh, to, to understanding your, your light environment and maybe making improvements to it. That's great. I have a couple other questions while we're waiting for others. Uh, I, I realize that most of the, um, greatest problem comes from commercial lighting. Uh, I've learned that tonight. And street lighting. Yeah. And street lighting. Uh, there's been such a, um, profusion, it seems in Arlington of, solar powered fence post caps and walkway lights, as well as um, architectural lighting um, has become more fashionable. And a lot of that is up lighting. So this is related to my second, that's not really a question, it's more of a comment and how do we address that is the question. And I'm wondering if your um, by lighting bylaw in Chelmsford that you're working on could potentially be more of a model for other communities. Ah, all right. So let me, yeah, uh, that lighting bylaw in Chelmsford, the overhaul that I've done, draws heavily from a generic template uh, that we have created for everyone to use. And so the Massachusetts chapter of Dark Sky International um, is called darkskymass.org, just all smooshed together, darkskymass.org. And there you will find this um this uh uh this outdoor lighting bylaw template right. and um it's been developed over the last year and a half i was involved others were involved we had the lighting professional involved with it you know it's it's interesting that the lighting professional his name is glenn heinmiller he's based in cambridge um and he says you know it doesn't matter what kind of regulation you come up with because only the ones that are really well grounded in best practice are the ones that lighting people are going to follow. If you make it too extreme, they're they're not going to be followed. And in your case, you know, you have you have a um a, a complaint driven bylaw. So someone needs to go and complain to the inspectional services and say this lighting is is awful. Uh, have them do something about it. Assuming that you can't reach. A consensus with your neighbor or whoever is creating the light um and it's it's hard because that your your bylaw doesn't have a lot of the specificity that a lighting person would use to say yes you're in compliance no you're not uh, but i i will say one of the things that carol and i have been talking about is especially with new construction it's always easier to create lighting that's in compliance before it's installed and so it's incumbent on your uh, redevelopment board uh, who passes judgment on all the new development in town to insist that the developers come forward with a, with a lighting plan with specifics. What's the model? What's the wattage? What's the output? Um, so, that, so that that can be, not only can it be, uh, it puts them on notice that you're paying attention, but it's also something that the building inspector can compare after the fact, there's a long road between a set of plans to the architect, to the contractor, to the final installation. Um, and and so this is a way to ensure that what is agreed to at the outset is actually what gets installed. Great. Great point. I don't see other hands. Uh, I still see Mr. Eichamp's hand, but uh, if you want to try one more time. Um, Carol, he said his unmute isn't working. Oh, um, maybe he could that. maybe he could type his question in the chat. I I that's how he communicated with me. I'm not sure if he still has a question. But... Okay. Okay. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I kind of don't even want to let you go. I'm learning so much, and this has been so um, informative and motivating for me. And you have such a wonderful way of describing all of this in, in a manner that, in my view, seems so accessible to non-scientists like myself. 
and it makes it seem possible to to make fixes and and improve things in the future. So, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm, I'm yes. grateful to you, and um, I'm also I've made a note about Avalon Owens at Tufts. Maybe that could be another program for the Arlington Land Trust to present. She'd be fantastic for you. Um, um, big comment about profound gratitude from a participant. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. I hope you all got a chance to see the Auroras last uh, last Friday. Uh, that was that was that was awfully special. That kept you busy, I know. And oh, wow, did it? Yes, <laughs> yes, it did. Beautiful. Well, listen, thank you all again for joining tonight. And um, um, I, I'm very passionate about this. I hope that's come across, and I I think you can become passionate too. You know, the I, I want to end with one anecdote. Um, one person can make a difference at a large scale. In Chelmsford, we had a little, sad little uh, mall, strip mall in the center of town uh, that had, used to have a uh, Marshalls and a stop and shop, <clears throat> and it, it became uh, uninhabited. And a local um, developer, uh, Win Stanley Properties, based in Concord, bought the property and uh, redeveloped it. And in the course of that, they they took the existing lighting and they replaced it with LEDs. And I was keeping tabs on this and and I saw that they were using a particular fixture. And I, I through the architect, I got a message to uh, Adam Wynn Stanley, who was the, the principal. And I said, look, I, I know that this fixture comes in a lower color temperature than what you've specified. Please consider doing that. Well, it turns out he had an environmental uh, soft side and um, uh, when it, the lighting was finally installed, it was gorgeous. And I would invite all of you to come up to Chelmsford sometime. We too have great restaurants in our downtown area. And um, and and take a look at, at the uh, Chelmsford Plaza is what it's called. And after, he, after this was installed, because I didn't really have any interface with him otherwise, I got back to him and I said, this is wonderful. Thank you so very much for helping preserve uh, the ambiance of our town. And he said, no, thank you. We like the look on that so much that we're retrofitting all of our properties with those LEDs. That's a huge win. Too, too late. My unmute finally unmuted. All right, Bill, go ahead. Okay. I live near Route 2. About seven or eight years ago, the State Highway Commission took down all the street lights on Route 2 and put in a new electrical service between Route 2 and Route 128. They put up new street lights, and after maybe three years of darkness, they illuminated them. The double street light nearest Route 60 uh, shines on Spy Pond with an illumination brighter than the full moon, except for about five or six hours a month. Uh, it also shines in my window. So I called the state highway people four or five times, and to their credit, they showed up. And they came on my porch with their light meters, and they measured it. And they commented, oh, yeah, the guy on the other side of Route 2 in Belmont is also complaining about that light. And one of the guys had a computer, and he was able to turn it off. I should have offered him 100 bucks to show me how he did it. <laughs> but nothing changed. That light still illuminates Spy Pond, it illuminates my house, it illuminates the house in Belmont, and it's obscenely bright. I have no idea whether highway improvement is better now, or safety is better now than in the many years where there are no street lights at all up Route 2. But yeah, getting the state to say, yeah, we got a problem and doing something about it is a very different thing. Well. Funny you should mention that. Um, I've had some encounters with MassDOT, and uh, I am I am aghast actually that because I drive Route Two still plenty of times. I am aghast that they they opted to install what's called continuous roadway lighting. There is a there is a pole you know every 150 feet or so all the way down Route Two. Regardless, it's it's controlled access. It's not exactly, you know, uh, on the Autobahn in Germany. Uh, there, there's no need for lighting except at the on-ramps and off-ramps. And yet they've done it there. They've done it on Route 3 going up through Medford, uh, 93 going up through Medford. 
and it's no longer really considered best practice. Out in California, a place with thousands of miles of freeway, they don't do that. They only light the exits and the on-ramps and off-ramps. Now, maybe you're like, because you're at Route 60, that might be one of those cases. In any case, um, I should let you all know that there is a bill in, pending in the state legislature um, that is uh, that would have, that would control that in part. And the principal house sponsor is Sean Garbley, who I believe represents Arlington. Uh, and so um, you can all con and we're 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 pretty far along the process. There's only a couple months left in the in this session, but we have hope that our bill will be passed. And one of the things it would do, Bill, is it would dictate that MassDOT follow best practices and make an annual report on how well they're doing, among other things. And so uh, I encourage you all to, to contact Sean, uh, Representative Garberly, and thank him because he has sponsored this bill for several sessions now, and he's wholeheartedly behind it. And ask, uh, for those of you who don't have him as your rep, please contact your rep to encourage their support. We're getting near the finish line here. We have a good chance of having this pass this session, uh, and we need every bit of help that we can. It's um, if you can just go to the legislators' website and look up "dark sky bill," and everyone on the hill, everyone on Beacon Hill knows it as the "dark sky bill," and you'll be able to find it. I I will do that. Uh, a, a little bit of shading would have done everything to illuminate the highway. Uh, yeah. so my pond and my house are not the highway. Right. But it's it's fully illuminated all the time, and it's a royal pain. And the only thing the only thing I can suggest is because it is illuminating spy pond. I don't know if that's an environmentally sensitive area with marshes and wetlands and so forth, but that would be a basis for approaching MassDOT and say you are not. You did not do your job when you did the environmental assessment on this lighting plan. There will have been, somebody will have designed where those lights went and how bright they had to be. And, uh, um, uh, you know, if 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 I can, I'll, I'll try to take a look at it. But as you say, they've been in there for a while now. Let, so the, let me tell you why you're unduly optimistic. MassDOT used to put sand on Route 2 and it filled up a whole part of Spy Pond. We went to them and said, you're filling a great pond, it's illegal. 35 years later, hmm. they cleaned it up. Hmm. I haven't got 35 years left. Got it. Well, uh, I'm sorry for you, and uh, I wish it were otherwise. Uh, yeah. One of the things that is, is true um, is that the Dark Sky International is... We're, we're the gatekeepers on this. We're the ones who are paying attention and, and trying to affect, you know, global, national, regional, state, local change. Um, it's a it's a fairly small organization. It's only got about 15 employees. And it, it's it's we could do so much more if we had the funds to do it. So here's my commercial pitch. It's thirty five dollars a year. Darksky.org is the place to go. I would uh I would recommend your your supporting it and uh, thanks for considering anyway. Thank you so much, Kelly. I'm going to let you rest your throat now and <laughs> tell you, I'm I'm delighted um, and very grateful to you as I know everyone else is. So thank you all for coming uh, to your Zoom link tonight to uh, listen to this fantastic presentation. And let's let's um, commit to ourselves to try to kind of form a little cadre of, of folks. Um, I think I see a lot of familiar names on here. Um, feel free to track me down. Uh, my email address shows up on the Arlington list from time to time. And I'll um, try to track some of you down too to see if we can uh, become a little more of a force together to uh, make some improvements. So Thank you all so much and um, go on these websites and uh, thanks for your support um, of the Arlington Land Trust and please support uh, darksky.org. Thank you and good night. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks again.